All right. Podcast 688. 688 in the house. It's May 25th. The year 2023, as Mike said. This is the Crushing Iron Podcast, episode 688. And that's Coach Robbie, and I'm Milos. Me, that's right, Mike. <laughs> Coach Mike Milos Tarali. It is a beautiful day here in Overland Park, Kansas. I would imagine, since it's basically June, then all Wisconsin gets is beautiful day. So I'm imagining you're having pretty much the same. It is, uh, man, it's hard to believe it's almost June, almost halfway through the year. A busy year and a busy rest of the year. Um, but we're excited to be here today. As we said, we come twice a week. Uh, that's Coach Mike. I'm Coach Robbie. It's your first time tuning in today. Welcome. We appreciate you giving us your time. We know you have quite a lot of options in the triathlon podcast universe and just podcasts in general terms of revivals. We appreciate you tuning in today. We cover it all. We do swim, bike, and run specific podcasts. We do race recaps and also love race previews. But for the most part, Mike and I as coaches, athletes, best friends, we just sit back, relax, have an open, honest discussion about what we're going through in life, not just as human beings, but also as coaches and athletes ourselves. We also talk frequently about what our own athletes are going through. Mike and I work with a wide range of athletes all across the globe from beginner-level triathletes to the very first 5K or sprint triathlon all the way up through a little of amateurs trying to get back to world championships and everyone in between from all over the globe. And we use the feedback loop we have with them and training peaks, emails, text messages, and the like to drive the discussion of the day. Uh, we also frequently utilize our Facebook group. You can search that, Crushing Iron Group. Answer the one simple question. Don't just request. Answer the simple question, and we'll let you right in. A lot of awesome people in there, fantastic community, and a very solid resource in a sport that is oftentimes way overcomplicated and way too confusing. It is uh, it's a, uh, it's like the Dewey Decimal System of a triathlon knowledge. You can just peruse, pick through, find the right uh, book, the right resource, and we got an answer for you. Uh, for those that are, that are millennials, you have no idea what the Dewey Decimal System is. Pretty probably never stepped foot in the library. Um, but that's the place. <laughs> it is the spot for you. A lot of awesome people in there will occasionally go uh, in there and do a little bit of Q&A, take the pulse of the community, and uh, answer questions as best we can. And probably do that next week as you're all recovering from your Memorial Day weekend uh, extravaganzas. Um, and most people are already mailed in. There's like no one in the co work space today. But anyway, we uh, that's all we got. We don't do sponsors. We don't do ads. But we do have an agenda, and that's to do our best to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey. Yeah, speaking of Dewey Decimal, I'm sure people out there haven't heard of microfiche. <laughs> I remember the old microfiche. Oh, that was, yeah, that was like when you had the deep report. You had to go deep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got. I need the. I need the New York Times from 1972. 72. Try 42. <laughs> April 3rd. Uh, they're like, all right. Here is the April. Here's the microfiche from the April of that year. That's it. <laughs> you yeah. got to go through in like the dark room and like <laughs> and like scroll through all of the pages of the newspaper just to try and find it. Sometimes didn't they even have like time magazine in the microfiche? Like they did like some magazines they would put in there as well. Not just like newspapers and stuff like that. But yeah, that is, that's back. That ages us. Most people. Well, I think most of our audience is probably in that age range too. They're probably like, yeah, I know a little bit of microfiche. Yeah. I mean, it was basically just scanning newspapers and things like that. I mean, it's really different than they do right now. It just wasn't digital. So, I mean, it's like this, Scanning is no real new thing or anything. No, nah, it's just like we had know. that way back in the day. Hey, speaking <laughs> of, but it's like uh, you mentioned uh, Wisconsin. Yeah, this is a time of year where I don't even think about weather anymore. It just happens. Yeah. You, you know? know what you're going to get. You walk outside, hoodies and sh- hoodies and shorts, and you yep. got what you got. Yep, pretty much perfect. That's pretty nice. much perfect. And uh, I just want to see if uh, um, that Milos reference, if anybody gets it. I'll give you a hint. We, no. were ta- we were talking about tennis, so leave it in the comments. Leave it yeah, in the comments. Yeah, I'm sure. And if you did, don't be offended by it. Too yeah. many people get offended too easily these days. Oh, really? Smash um, that like button. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Smash that like button. Not that many races going on this weekend. Uh, for obvious reasons. Most people don't schedule them besides, like, you know, the old, you know, uh, Memorial Day 5K or 10K. That'll be on Monday. So I hope everyone has an awesome weekend. Get out there. Have fun. 
uh, enjoy yourself. Enjoy the downtime. Enjoy family, friends, cook out, whatever, whatever it is you want to do to celebrate. Uh, Victoria 70.3 is happening. Though. That's in Canada. Yeah, they, they don't care about Memorial Day. I think they actually had theirs like this last week or something. Um, but that's that's the one big race going on this weekend. You got uh, Calgary ITU race, which I think should be live to watch Saturday morning for most of you when you wake up. That should be a really, really good race. Those of you that follow the um, – Old school America, because she's now old school, but Gwen Jorgensen, who's making her trying to make her comeback to at least make the mixed relay team in 2028 or 2024. Uh, her bid for that <clears throat> is her first uh, outside of like, the world and continental cups that she's been racing in. She's off the wait list. She will be racing this weekend. I, I'm not really sure I see her placing in the top 20. Um, but I do think it'll be a wetsuit swim. So again, I say this all the time. Some people listen, most people don't, but if you want to learn a lot about a triathlon and truly watch the best triathletes on the planet race, the fastest ones, then watch that. Um, it's really awesome to watch super fun and you can learn a lot. So that's, that's this weekend. Other than that, it's pretty low key. Um, kind of like our low key podcast, although we do have a not so low key topic today. We usually, uh, we've been bringing in a little bit of the. We were. I was told earlier this week we were dropping dimes uh, on this last week's podcast about uh, you know, the hopes and dreams dying in the details, which is true um, when I talk about racing and paying attention to details. But it's also um, an amazing time to do things, and we always encourage athletes to race short course, right, and do as or, or to race a lot, right. We all got way out of the habit in 2020, 2021 of just being accustomed to not racing a lot. And uh, honestly, th- see, like that's part of the reason you've seen, you know, the mirage of triathlons decline in racing. And it's, I don't really think that's true. There's just as many triathletes. People have just chosen to race less because they got into that, you know, um, behavior, right? Coming out during the pandemic, no one raced. Some people I think don't like racing because the anxiety and the nerves and the, and the fear of not meeting expectations or riding outside or whatever it is. Um, people just got in the habit of racing less. I mean, you can't race less or you'll, you won't race at all because you race like once a year. So you're the typical triathlete. You might train year round, you might do a triathlon podcast, but you race once a year. So that obviously hurts numbers, but we always encourage athletes to rip off some five K's, 10 K's, you know, set up your, your late last minute Memorial day, five K, 10 K if they have one, but just race, you know, racing is something that has to be practiced um, in order to do well at it. And there's also a lot of fun that you can have in sprint in Olympic distance racing, not just fun as in realizing that you can be done in like two hours and not 14, but just fun as in, letting go of expectations, having the best time possible, but experimenting with pacing, experimenting with, you know, going watchless and exploring your athletic side, or more importantly, your competitive side, which I think you and I talked a little bit before the podcast today. You know, I understand this. I was this way my first few years in triathlon. We all want to complete the race, right? We want to complete it. We don't want to not finish. We don't want to burn our biscuits too early. But there's something to be said, right, for whether you're competing against the field, you're competing against those in your age group, you're competing for a qualifying spot, you're competing against, you know, friends you might know, you're competing against, you know, those of the same sex. But ultimately, you're always competing against yourself, right? Against yourself, you're competing. And I think what happens when we don't race a lot or when you only race long and you race so calculated that you're so terrified to make you know to take a risk right or to push it farther that you 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 end up not exploring your full potential and that's where short course racing comes into play and that's obviously been a focus of ours this year is highlighting short course races and the benefits uh and experiments you can have by participating in those events and we'll do a little bit of that today but i think it's a great topic hope you enjoy it uh but yeah i think the competitive side is a is a side of racing that we should all explore more often I agree. You know, uh, you'll be proud of me. I, one of those okay. recent races that you really liked, I watched a video, like, highlight recap of one of them. It was the one a few weeks ago. and may, I don't know if it was actually a short course or if it was a half or, a, like, a merged version, the one that uh, uh, Browning went way out in front and then Newman won it. Is that one, one of the ones you like? Uh, 
<laughs> and Blumenfeld yeah, was chasing true. him, and it was like came right down the, to the wire. The, yeah, you're talking about the PTO uh, European Open that was. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. That was what it was. Felt was like trying his hardest to run down. Look at you. I know. Check me out, dude. Uh, but that when you're talking about that, that's what I think of is like obviously that kind of stuff because they were just. I mean, they they talked about how Browning just likes to go out and lay it down Blue, and Blumenfeld, not Browning. Oh, he doesn't. Yeah, so it's Blumen, Blumenfeld was chasing. Are you you you, you might but, be talking about Alistair Brownlee coming off the bike. Oh, Brownlee, yeah, that's what I meant. Or, you're talking about Brownlee coming <laughs> off the bike. See, I'm, right, I'm, on a, I'm all over the shit, man. But like, yeah, he he sets the tone. He said he likes to set the tone a lot in the races, and he he ended up getting caught and faded. But um, anyway, that's why. I, him. Yeah, a lot of people think like he'll never do anything. I actually think honestly, if he's healthy when Nice comes around and he's healthy, he's my pick to win. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that course suits him. I mean, I, listen, I I'm gonna live and die on Brownlee. I've been putting him up there because he, he always gets hurt. But I I just love the way that he races. He he swims out front. He sets the pace on the bike, and then you know people want to rag him for you know not pacing correctly and always blowing up. But like that's. He, he can do what he wants. He's Alistair Brownlee. He's a two-time Olympic gold medalist. He can do two what he wants. Time, <laughs> two times he's won the Olympic gold. Arguably the best triathlete ever. I mean, I think that's, you know, he would need to win, you know, a couple of Ironman or something with the World Championships for those of them that care. But, I mean, he, he can do what he wants. Um, and that's just, yeah, he, I love the way they raised and, and Lucy Charles Barkley races the same, right? She was the, she was the, um, she did the same thing. She's a front pack swimmer. She swims out front. She bikes out front and she just tries to hold on. I mean, what else are you going to do? If that's your strength, that's your strength. And I, I love that they don't fade and try to participate so much in the group dynamics. They go for it and they have fun with it. And I just think that's. You know, you, you get your juices flowing. I think I think it's good. And again, like, you know, as age group athletes, you know, only one person's gonna lead the race and the rest of us are falling behind. But it's just a great skill to I think explore. And and honestly, I think if you're looking to ignite and, and let's be honest, I think a lot of athletes struggle with <clears throat> with burnout. And it's not really a, not not so much the the training, right? Some people do over I mean, let's be honest, a lot of people overtrain. But it's mostly from the emotional and mental expectations. But what I also think is part of like the burnout process or not having fun with triathlon anymore is that we try to we try to make everything so calculated, right? You know, you and I and we'll talk about this in a minute with the race of this last weekend. But you know, we talk about Alan and I talk about this all the time when it comes to Hayden and I've talked to other parents about it. Is that kids don't have enough free time these days to just do stuff, explore, be free, not be scheduled, right? Not have exact things they have to do. And, you know, you want them to play sports, but you want them to have free time. I mean, I'll talk about this, you know, a couple, a couple days ago, uh, or a couple of podcasts ago about, you know, the, it was skipping tennis and going to playing wiffle ball for two and a half hours. And yesterday he was, you know, Hayden was like, there was no sports. He was just running around the neighborhood, just doing whatever, going to school playground, coming back, doing stuff outside, just being a kid. Right, what kids are supposed to, and they're not supposed to be scheduled like parents are. But that's that's kind of what we've gotten to, and you wonder why kids get so fed up with sports or their attitude is shit. Right, like it's one of the things that we notice. You know, I notice with myself, right? I notice with Hayden when he's overscheduled. Like you go to school, right, and you have to listen to somebody. You have to be, you know, have to listen, have to do all these things, and you come home and you listen to your parents or you got to listen to coaches. It's like, when do I get to just think for myself and just explore and be things and or make mistakes? Right. And I think that there's a similarity there between athletes and not having fun with racing because they feel like they're they've been reined in. I, I've got to be very specific. I've got to be very calculated. There's no freedom. There's no fun. It's just race expectation. And then at some point, if you're not doing things that are just for the fun of it and exploring when are you going to learn? It's like we, we, we're all afraid to kind of step out of that box and you wonder why you feel so trapped and paralyzed or oh, you've overanalyzed everything so you don't know how to perform. That doesn't sound very fun, right? It sounds miserable, honestly. And I do, I honestly believe that's why a lot of people fall out of the sport is they try to be so calculated and overthink. I mean, triathletes are, are famous, right, for being type A and overthinking everything. I mean, every single day 
I get questions, you know, about that. I'm like, I think you might be overthinking this just a smidge. Mm -hmm. I mean, yesterday I had to answer a question that, and I just simply said, I'm going to pretend like I didn't see this text. (laughs) I'm like, I didn't see it because it was, it was like, we overthink everything. And like, there's so much freedom in not thinking. Right. So this last, I haven't, you know, I raced, uh, I was going to race Wisconsin number three last year, had a great swim, had some major stomach issues, ended up not going out on the bike did Ohio the last year. I haven't raced much period in the last four or five years. And it's really kind of, it's eaten at me. And then what I've also found within myself is the longer I've been away from racing, the harder I have felt to get back into racing, the racing mindset. Right. And, and I do think like, to be frank, like an honest, like I think a lot of coaches struggle sometimes with racing and how many athletes they have they're racing and then maybe expectations they put on themselves with other athletes that are racing and then themselves it's it's very hard mentally and emotionally to kind of like be selfish enough in the moment to race your own race and be totally dialed in while you've got you know maybe 20 other people doing the same thing that day but again i want to talk to what i've been working on is getting out of my comfort zone and doing different things and playing tennis is being more competitive taking more risks having more fun with it because it doesn't really matter and so there was a local triathlon here this last weekend here in Kansas City. And I do have to say this first and foremost. It was one of the best put on races I've ever been a part of. The If you're looking for a race to do next year that's got duathlon, sprint distance, and Olympic distance, it'll be either the second or third week in, in May like it usually is. But the Kansas City triathlon is unreal. It's an open water swim in a beautiful setting, sprint and Olympic distance, and then – a completely closed bike course. Nice. No cars, period. Not even cars waiting at intersections. When I say closed, it's closed. You don't see a car. Roads are great. It's a little bit, you know, it's got some hills, but it's 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 awesome. And then the run course is on like passes. No cars, no interruptions, no nothing. Great course, great experience. I told with doing it all week, but that's almost like, you know what? Just do it. Go out, have fun, no expectations. The weather is going to be beautiful. So it's, it's just no excuse not to pass up. So it was Sunday morning, uh, signed up Friday, picked up packet Saturday, and then had to like, you know, make sure that I actually had all the gear that I, need, that I needed to have to race because it's been so long. Um, and then went out there. Uh, it was wetsuit legal, but then it was 500 meter swim. So I was like, mm, I'm not wearing a wetsuit, even though I haven't swam that much recently. I was like, I'm not wearing a wetsuit. Um, wore my, tri- you know, wore my tri kit. And then I finally decided when I finally decided not to wear my wetsuit is again, sprint distance, not really my, not really my distance of choice. Uh, but also with the training I've been doing probably the appropriate distance of my choice. And, but I decided right before I went down to walk towards the water was, you know what? I, I I'm haven't been naked. necessarily do what I'm going to swim naked. You're swim, I'm gonna swim naked. I'd be a great, I'm great feeling it today. As I, as I said, you know what I, today, the result will be what it'll be. But today for me is about having fun, letting loose and racing. And because honestly, I haven't done that in a while to just show up to a race. And when I say race, I mean, be a competitor see someone out in front and go get them and not be worried about what my watch says, right? To slow down or to not. So that's what I was kind of going back to when you're talking about, I thought you were talking about Blumenfeld trying to chase down Max Newman is, do you think he's looking at his watch thinking, oh, you know what? I I really am not supposed to run five tens. If I, I, I'm supposed to run five eighteens, that, that'll, that's going to get me second place, but I really need to stay there. And so I don't, cause I don't want to go into, you know, zone five and start producing lactate too early. So I really need to do this. No, he just runs balls to the wall and to see if you can win. That's it. All it is about winning. So I say, you know what? I'm going to take my watch off and I'm just going to do the entire race with no watch. I've never done that in my life. I've done plenty of run races, watchless, but no swim pace, no Watts on the bike, no heart rate, just straight, watch or excuse me straight nothing so I walk down there and i know i was annoying people because I, I kept asking what time it was and everyone's got to watch on because i was we were supposed to start at at uh, at 8 30 and i knew we were starting a little bit late because the, the, some of the olympic athletes were taking a little bit longer out of the water but i was like what time is it what time is it and they're probably like why don't you know what time it is where's your you know <laughs> nine foot by nine foot garmin watch on your wrist like the rest of us have and, the, and finally we get in the water we go in we swim 
get out of the water and I felt great. And I, you know, the first thing I did when I got out of the water, check your watch. Exactly. <laughs> check my wrist. And I was like, Oh shit, it's not there. I forgot. So I had no idea what my time was, but I knew I was somewhere towards front. And then I just kind of like flipped the switch and you know what? Have fun and race it. Flew through transition, got on the bike. And all I could think about on the bike was trying to catch somebody in front of me and to go as hard as I could go. I had nothing to look at. All I could feel was my heartbeat. All I could feel were my legs. All I could listen to was my breathing. And all I could see was the competition, right? And you got turnarounds. You can see people. And I was just, I was hammering it as hard as I could with no regard for anything else. Am I going over power? Am I going under power? What's my average miles per hour? What's my max speed? Is my heart rate too high? I wonder if I can sustain. There were no questions. And I found it, one, I found the, the, the bike portion, which at the sprint was 12, went by so fast. It was over in like two seconds. Mm-hmm. I didn't think. You were, just, you, were, you were just in pursuit. Next person up the road. Next person up the road. How fast can I go? How hard can I go? There's no questions. There's no analyze. There's no self-doubt. You just are what you are. Come back in. Uh, come back in from the bike. I knew there's probably a couple guys ahead of me because uh, I wasn't catching them on the turnarounds. And then hopped off the bike. And then it was just, obviously, it's a 5K. It's just run your ass off. And I knew that I had been running well. And again, no watch. I ran the whole thing. I didn't even look at my wrist because by then I knew, by, by then I ran myself, I didn't have it. And then it was just about finding people in the distance to try and catch. I knew one guy with like this like bright color kit was ahead of me and it was just running. It was just, for lack of a better term, it was just my, what I was telling myself was mow them down. I mean, as many as you can. Who cares if you blow up? It's a 5K. You're going to blow up. It's fine. It'll be done. And it was just blow up until you blow up. And I did. I, I think I ran a couple places and caught some guy in the last point two, and ran like right just over a twenty minute five k, which isn't bad for for coming off the bike. And so I was actually really happy with that. And got done. No, no watch. Look at. Didn't know what place I had come in. Knew nothing. But I was I had so much fun. One because it was sprint. It's over in like an hour. But it went by so fast and it was just so fun to not worry about what was my pace, what was my time or my Watts or my heart. I never second guessed myself ever the entire time. I never second guessed myself. I never wondered if I was going too hard. I never wondered if I was going too easy. I I would never wondered if I was going to make it to the end. My only goal was to have fun and just be a competitor. Try to catch the next person in front of you. And I think that one contributed to, having a good result, but also just having a really great time and approaching a race in such a different, you know, we, we participate in these races where you've got 500 people, 1500 people, 2000, 3000. And it is right. You're all running your own race, which again, like we're all about effort and execution. We preach it all the time when it comes to 70.3s and falls. But when it comes to, I think a guy even posted about this in our closed Facebook group is this last week. He said, I took my, you know, took Mike and Robbie's advice this last weekend on the sprint, you know, it was real simple. It's like, you know, swim controlled bike. Like there's no run, find a way to run simple. And yeah, I think he, I think he won the race or something like that. And he was like, it was amazing. And so much fun is like, it's not so much about the going hard part, right? We're all going to go hard, but it's about removing all the, um, all the confusion and opportunity to be distracted of and stay in the moment, but more importantly, race, right? And yeah, if you, even if you're a middle of pack, back of the pack person, there's still somebody to catch. There's still somebody to challenge yourself with. There's still somebody to try and bridge the gap to, right? There's still markers out there to try and get to quicker. It's being a competitor, right? And I think that's just, it's become a lost art with how, calculated and perfected we have to be or think to be because we're so afraid to fail that we don't ever really have fun. And, and again, by having fun breeds success. And I I think it's just a great thing to explore and for athletes to do. And something obviously we've encouraged for forever is, you know, race watch list and just go for it, go for broke hammered. I've been told an athlete this this last weekend that I've only been working with for about six months uh, asking for watts, you know, say, ah, maybe I said, you know what? Let's fucking hammer the bike. Just do it. See what happens. And then she ended up getting third in her age group at Chattanooga. I was like, never. It's like, I think a lot of times as athletes, you look to your coach to with, for precision, right? Which we can provide precise of watts, precise, you know, precision pacing. Here's what to do. 
But in order for you to be the best and ultimately know how to race yourself, because we won't be there on race day, you got to, I think sometimes athletes look to the coach actually to say, Hey coach, can you just take the reins off today? And can I just go freaking go for it? Like, cause what it does is it allows that freedom and it also removes expectations and the fear, right? Which is a huge reason why we both do this is like, what you also do in that moment is you remove some responsibility from the athlete and you say, you kind of say, Hey, if it goes bad, it's on me, right? Blame me. I told you to, I told you to go out on a bike. If you blow up, blame me. So to, as an athlete to have a coach and be able to go into your race with big, Hey, well, I can't let down my coach. He told me to do this. He told me to have fun. He told me to rip it. That sounds fun. And so as long as I do that, I'll have fun and I'll do what he told me to do. There is no loss. Right? And I do think that's why so many athletes succeed under that kind of, again, you don't say it all the time, but this athlete was doing, is doing an Ironman next month. So it was, it was just a good, I think, experiment to do. It's an opportunity to learn and have fun. And, and again, remove the overcalculated you know, paralysis by analysis nature that so many athletes find themselves in these days. Yeah. Well, that, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you're talking about the racing mindset and it is different. I think a lot of people, obviously, and us included, get in the sport to, you know, feel good and just be healthy and things like that. And I remember when I got into running and endurance and things like that, I joined that group in Nashville and we did the running stuff. And, and I was like, and that's kind of about when I met you and we always used to kind of connect on the competitive spirit of things. And then the other guys we were training with, um, not well, the group that the running group, I should say was a little bit more like, ah, uh, you know, I, I was just like taken back cause I'd always played sports. Right. And, and I was just sort of naturally a competitive person <clears throat> and I was blown away in a good and bad way by how supportive everybody was, <laughs> you know, like in your age group and, like, you know, they would cheer you on to beat them almost. <clears throat> that was like a mindset I had to be like, what? And then when you and I started working together and I remember, and I, I had a zoom call last night with some athletes and I was talking about this. And, um, when I started, remember, I mean, I always, I, well, I was always chrono. Um, I just had a stopwatch basically on my wrist and, and then eventually, um, over the years I got a Garmin and I was just t- talking about this last night. I was like, I think I was just better when mm-hmm. I used to race without a Garmin. And I, it's one of those things where, like you said, I mean, you just can't, I mean, I'm a habitual person like that. So I'll be looking and mm-hmm. you look at your pace and, and then all those, like, who knows what goes through your head when you see a pace, <clears throat> right? You just, uh, well, this reminds me of that day when I blew up or whatever it might be. You know, like these weird connective tissues in your brain that sort of take you back to your childhood when a bad day, you know, like, so it's like when I used to race with just chrono and I, it, the race I think of first is that one in Muncie when we went over there, my first 70.3 and I did, you know, I had like, for me, swimming is a little more, I got to be a little more cautious. I'm kind of that I got to warm up right, or it could really go to hell. So I just want to have a decent swim. And then, then I do remember being on the bike and, uh, you know, you, ha- you have a little bit, I mean, I, th- I might've had uh, miles per hour on there, but it, you know, it's just all over the board and stuff like that. But I was just, I remember going hard on that thing. And I remember passing all these people, uh, there was this little weird kind of bumpy section and I was just kind of balls to the walls on that thing. And then the same thing was you just get to the run and I wasn't looking at pace or anything, but I was just digging in and, and doing the best I could and just keep, you know, just keep going and keep going through the pain and things like that. And it ended up being a really good race for my first one. But I think the more calculated we get sometimes, I, you know, I, cause I've also seen a lot of people who race really well and solid with, you know, power and heart rate and things like that. So I don't want to like say no to that stuff, but for me, I, it, it, it almost gets in my way um, because like when I'm out there racing, I think there's just a, you know, I run around my neighbor, my old neighborhood where I grew up and there's a, the place I run is like a path, a trail that goes like up and 
back and forth be around uh, the old boys club where I used to hang out. And it's a big old field, football field and baseball field. And there's all kinds of stuff up there. And now it's just like growing weeds all over it and everything. And I just the other night I was like, man, because this brought me back to what you said about how everything's so calculated with kids and how often we are just up there free, just inventing shit to play against each other. Just like coming up with games. We didn't ever, you know, we always, you know, we play a baseball game with like 11 guys, you know, so we had it six against five or whatever. And we had to figure out the safe field and all this kind of stuff. And, but it was really just kind of uh, creating ways to be competitive and, and get the best out of yourself and, and challenge you. And so now it's like, I don't know, I just feel like sometimes winning and going after it and being aggressive gets kind of a bad name, but we all love to watch, you know, people like uh, Blumenfeld and, and Browning going after, or Brown, Brownlee. Uh, Lee. <laughs> Sorry, man. Disrespect the man like that. You know, but like, no. it's just their general persona, I think about it. Yeah. It's like, it gets, they just get after it. And, and that's what a race is. You know, we train. I mean, I, I think about this all the time, like how many hours we put in in training, right? If you train and follow the program, you're putting in a crap ton of hours, and uh, which is a good thing. But that's setting your bones and base up for to actually go for it on race day a little bit. You know, you got to kind of flirt with that edge. And I do that all the time in training. I kind of try to, like I say, I always say, I simulate little race moments and things like that. That's always in my mind. It's like, what, what would I do if this happened right now in a race? How could I handle it? You know, and sometimes that may be, you know, take a little breather or, or it may be just push through depending on where you're at on the course. I mean, you have to really understand that. And, and just that competitive fire, man, is uh, I do feel like it kind of has, you know, so a, there's a slippery slope in it sometimes. And yeah, but obviously a lot of people still get because we're always amazed, right? Holy shit. They went, you know, mm-hmm. sub four hours in a 70.3. It's like, how the hell they do that? Well, they stop thinking about shit and they go, <laughs> they just let yeah. it rip, you know, check the potential. It's, it's, yeah. At some point you just have to, right. Cause I think, and you brought up such a great point about, you know, I don't think you ever know what your brain is going to deviate to first, right. When you're running a pace or biking a certain speed or, or whatever, is it going to go back to affirmation or doubt, right? Mm-hmm. Is it going to go back and affirm? Oh yeah. But, I've, but that one ride I did, you know, I did that. So I got this. You know, even though most people, you know, some, a lot of times they'll bike harder in a race or is it going to be the opposite? Like, you know, the, I think I talked about this maybe a month ago, but I went out for a run and just felt just destroyed. I mean, I got my ass handed to me. Mm-hmm. Terrible run, didn't feel good. And the pace I was trying to meet that day for just three and four minute, a, a few three and four minute intervals was 6.05 to 6.30. And I was, and I was fighting tooth and nail and it was just a run i ended up running sunday I ended up running 624 625s for the 5k if i had looked down at any point and seen 620s i can tell you exactly what i would have thought that's too hot too hot <laughs> it's too hot you could fucking barely hold it for four minutes just three weeks ago <laughs> now, now you gotta hold it for 20 after you swam and biked no way Right on 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 crushed gravel and pass like there's no way I immediately would have probably probably put on the brakes, but all I was concerned about in the moment, having not known what I was doing, was the guy in the orange kit a quarter mile ahead. Am I gaining? Am I not gaining? Am I gaining? Am I gonna get my close him? I think I might get him. How much time do I have? I think it was two miles. I think most. That was it. It was just race and be free and and it's also fun. Right. And again, like you said, there's there's nothing wrong with trying to execute your race. Right. Nothing wrong with it, especially if you've never done it before. And I always recommend executing a race before you try to go beyond your fitness and transcend where you think you've been before in the past. Because you got to know how to execute a race first, because then you'll know how to push those buttons and, and kind of go above and beyond what you what you think. But at some point, you've got to practice, again, being a competitor, feeling what it is to fight, right? To fight for a different place, to fight to catch the person ahead, to fight to go faster, not, you know, worry about fighting harder. Don't worry about failing. 
We're so worried about failing hard and what the perception is going to be and what's going to go on with this and and everyone's going to know and and you know people are going to see and I'm like first of all people don't care, right? Even the even the people that come to watch you race, they still think you're doing, you know, a glow run with the swim. They have no idea what you're doing. They're just there because you because they got to go, right? No one knows we do, and you. But at some point, you can't be so afraid to fail that you truly never succeed. And you never push those boundaries. And you got to have fun with it. I mean, I love what you said about, you know, kids just going out and like making up games. I mean, half the time Hayden comes back inside from playing, he says some new game that I'm like, well, I'm like, what? How is that even a game? And yeah. he was like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we, we started playing it. And it, was, it was so much fun. I'm like, then who cares? <laughs> right? It was so much fun. Who cares what you call it? Who cares how it ended up? Did you have fun? Yeah, I did. Then who cares? Right. And so I think, Again, when it comes back to like having fun with what you're doing and, and taking that seriously and not the other stuff so seriously that, you know, you just, you have to, we all have that. Again, everyone, and a lot of people will argue they're not an athlete, and I totally disagree. Everyone is an athlete. Everyone has a piece of them that is athletic. It could be big, could be small, but it's about how you cultivate and how you grow that. But also being an athlete is a mindset, right? It is 100% a mindset. I can do this. I got this. It's having the confidence to do it. And that's how I feel. I've had a lot of that feeling like getting back on the tennis court lately. And I feel last night is like, I can get that ball. I can get that. I don't need to back up and run. I got this just because I'm an athlete. And it sounds, yeah, but that might sound cocky, but it's not. It's just, I'm telling myself I can. And so guess what? I'm more likely to do because I'm telling myself that I can instead of saying that I can't. And, you know, there's, there's so much, that's like the the biggest piece of self-talk I think is it comes across as, you know, and some of the best athletes of all time, right. Have, have, they rub people the wrong way. Jordan, Kobe, you know, Brady, you know, some of the best of all time, they rub people because they, they come off a different way but it's because they're also willing to do and focus and fight and be and um and be aggressive and, and not and not give in because they want the best and there's nothing wrong with that but it does it rubs people who want the wrong way who aren't who aren't interested right yeah. in in the best and you know it's funny I, I know I share a lot of Kobe stories but I was watching the the Redeem team on Netflix which to be honest was a was a very Awesome experience. Really, I watched the entire thing with Hayden, um, and he was all in because I really had to just make sure he knew that if he was going to like any basketball player, it had to be Kobe. It couldn't be LeBron, and so I made sure we got that we got that clear. But Kobe's they're talking about bringing in Kobe, right? The redeem team, and they uh, he came in and and they're all you know it's got Carmelo, LeBron, and you know all these you know Chris Paul, Dwayne Wade. You know, and they bring Kobe in, and they're like, and Kobe's first, and like, yeah, I'm just, you know, what's up? and uh, they're like, yeah, I'm just gonna surprise you, join. You know, he doesn't have that many friends. He's all about winning. He's all about getting the best. I'm so he goes, yeah, I'm just tired of seeing y'all lose. Uh, it was one of the reasons he came back. Then another quick story about just his work <laughs> ethic is, they're in Vegas during the training camp. The entire team goes out to like you know one of the the most popular clubs in Vegas. They come rolling in the hotel, being out all night. Dressed to the nines. All right, they roll in the hotel at four thirty. Who's in the lobby? Kobe. Where where had he just been? The gym. <laughs> the weight room. And they're like, What are you doing, man? Where are you going? He's like, I'm going to the gym. I'm gonna work out. <laughs> and yeah. it was funny listening to them talk about the it, the, the anyway the the kind of the wildfire effect that the rest of the team started doing the same thing because it was all you know for the pursuit of one goal. But anyway, it's just the the comp- I think com- being competitive, right? Like we talk about being selfish to people sounds like it's a negative. Sometimes being too competitive, right, is seen as a negative. It's not right. It's all about the delivery, right? Do you, if you're selfish, do you come across as, you know, a selfish prick? Yeah. Then you probably shouldn't be, you know, a person that doesn't care about us. But if you care about yourself, like genuinely, like what comes to self-care and eating right, sleeping right, wanting to reach your goals, that's not selfish. Oh, that's called being motivated. 
and and for now, for whatever reason, being motivated and committed has seemed like that you that you don't care about other things. No, it just means you care about doing some things that other people care about, you know, popping open a white claw at two PM and sitting there on the deck. That's that's their prerogative. That's fine. Same thing goes with being competitive. And they're just they're just too competitive for me. Well, how do you want to get the most out of yourself by being complacent? By being overly calculated? By racing with fear? By being worried you're going to bonk? That's a disservice. Disservice to you, disservice to your training, and a disservice to your ability and athletic ability to be a competitor, right? Because I'm telling you, the and we I think we talked about this the exact thing we, we talked about negotiating, you know, with yourself last week. The biggest competitor you're always going to face is you. It's it's your your stiffest competition, period. So think of the freedom you have by trying and feeling to compete against other people. You're not you're not going against your own nemesis. You're actually removing them from the picture. That's confidence. Right? So anything you can do to breed more confidence, to feel like more of an athlete, to get out of your own head, to stop obsessing about, you know, numbers. No matter if you're you're far in your journey, you've just started your journey, you're midway through, it's a big race, it's a small race, you got expectations. The expectations should always be just to get better. Everything else falls into place. But you we gotta keep doing things that allow you to be competitive and allow you to explore, right, that side of you, because all it does is breed confidence. Even if you fail, even if you fall short, even if you blow up, you have the confidence to do it. There's no confidence gained by kind of going hard and then being worried you might not finish, you don't go your best. You didn't do your best. You're so worried about about not do if you're worried about not doing your best, not being your best, then guess what? You're never gonna be it. You gotta take those risks. You gotta be an athlete. I <clears throat> I listen to a lot of these guys like uh Alan Watts, these philosopher type guys, and and even like watch, you know, successful business people and and it's the weirdest thing because they a lot of those people look at they talk about life as a game and when they say that, you know, it kind of initially just pisses you off because you're like, what do you mean life's not a game? It's serious, you know. We got to get, you know, take care of everybody and all this kind of stuff. But what they mean is they just flow through it like like a kid in a way. And it's just sort of like creating little new things and challenges or whatever. And that's what I think about all the time. And I've written about this before about, you know, live like a kid. And we've talked about it on here. And um, that's one of the things that, you know, like, what I'll do is in training a lot of times is cre- is create little games or something like that to keep my head sort of engaged and, and challenge myself. But even that, it's sort of like thinking and, and how about like, uh, you know, I think about my brother and I will always talk about like how my grandpa used to walk with he's hunched over and, um, you know, he just kind of shuffle along as he was getting older. And I think back and I'm like, shit, that dude was about my age right now when he was doing that. And, mm-hmm. So I'm always going, okay, well, you know, guys like Tony Robbins, they talk about getting in a state of mind or whatever it may be. And so sometimes I'll wake up and I'll be like, I'll kind of feel myself sliding into that grandpa mode, you know, that kind of hunched over. I'm sore. I'm, you know, I got to, you know, but then I immediately try to flip the switch into like this thing where, no, don't walk like that. Stand up and move, you know, and, and just flow. And I've talked to athletes about this all the time. I, I compare uh, triathlon, I, usually with running a lot of times, I'll compare it to dancing. And what, what I mean by that is just is being fluid and trying to find your flow with it because the, the more calculated you are and the more rigid you are with your pace and your watts and, I mean, your uh, heart rate and, and you start getting stiff. And I think our goal is always to run free, right? And, you know, we call it run free and without hesitation – and I think a lot of times that's the the hurdle that we get. It's sort of like catching yourself running down a hill or it's just letting go. And, you know, if you're dancing like that, looking at your watch and wondering, thinking about every move you make, you're going to get pulled off the dance contest floor in a heartbeat because they're mm-hmm. going to see it. They're going to be like, this, this cat can't, he can't do anything. So I think about that a lot. And I think about games and making the, the workouts games. I think about making the race a game. It's like you, like you were doing, you know, I just need to find that. I need to get that guy up there. And when you make that decision, you don't put your head down. 
you just somehow search inside of you, right, to find a little bit more without, uh, you know, putting the hammer all the way down. It's just sort of like laying on the gas a little bit, you know. How do you find those moments? How do you do those kind of things? Because you can you can keep it going, but the lot you just don't want to put it all the way to the floor and just burn out, right, on the spot. You just want to kind of gradually move on them, you know. Uh, it, it, a perfect example is last year in, at, at Wisconsin – I was mile 18, maybe, and I could barely move, man. I was just in really a bad spot after that r- ride, and the whole thing was just tough. Um, and mm-hmm. I was like, what am I going to do? I've got eight miles left to go. I mean, you know, cause, and I didn't want to walk it because that's just not me. And I, so, but I've, I figured I put a little game in my head. It was called 300, 100, and I would just, I would count my steps. I'd run for 300, and I walked for 100, and I just kept repeating it. And, and then it turned into 400, 100, you know, so I, it's like this thing, it kind of took my head away from the actual pain of things and the seriousness mm-hmm. of it. And I just was like having a little fun out there. I was in the darkness, dude, yeah. running down that muddy path by myself, playing this little game. And I think it, you know, I mean, I'll save my race, but it, it certainly kept me from completely just throwing the chips in. Yeah. And you, I think those are those things that, you just got to practice those and there's nothing wrong with being, you talk about Kobe, you know, I've, I've always been a Jordan guy and I think those guys can be the Gogginses of the world or whatever the, the, the elite, the best of the best at what they do. And I think they can frustrate people sometimes, but I've always looked at it as like, wow, okay, I can get a little out of that. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be Kobe or Jordan or Goggins, but there's certain things in there that can get you through moments. And we all face those moments, those challenges and it's just basically about sacking up and, and, and being competitive with yourself to get to another level, you know. And a quick quick one about – I actually watch a little – I like watching these little highlights of some of these old basketball players, and Bird was on last night. And you talk about cool. games. There was a guy – it was – they were playing the Hawks. I think it was the Eastern Finals. And the Hawks went down 2-0. They tied it up and went up 3-2, and they're in the Boston Garden. And they won game six, so Celtics are uh, – down a game going into game seven in the Boston garden. And, uh, they interviewed bird after that game and, uh, or no, that was even, I guess. And game seven and they interviewed bird and he goes, yeah, they really, they really screwed it. They blew their chance. Uh, Oh, that's what it was. The the Celtics tied it at three. And he said, yeah, they really blew their chance. They should have won it last night. There's no chance they're beating us in game seven. (laughs) He called that out. Love it. And, uh, it was uh, they're in the Boston Garden, and and after three periods, Bird only had twelve points, and uh, and Dominique Wilkins was actually telling the story. He goes, "Yeah, we're running down the court, and I think it was Kevin Willis, and I were right around Bird, and and Willis said, we got you shut down, man. You got nothing today.' He said that to him, and Dominique said, "Why did you do that?" <laughs> he probably went up for twenty in the fourth. He had twenty in the fourth. Yeah, and they won, but uh, yeah, so it was like. It was almost like about, Bird had to figure something out to get pumped up right there. Well, it's like it's like talking about being ignited, mm-hmm. right? What so does why, it take to ignite your fire? And, and I think we talk about burnout. A lot of people are burnt out, right? There's no flame. There's no flame. There's no fire. There's no burn. There's no there's no motivation, right? It's what it comes from, that internal fire. What does it burn for? Right? And a lot of people when they get burnt out, again, it's 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 more of a it, yes, a lot of people overtrain, but for a lot of people, it's just that like, that constant battle of of again going against yourself day to day, day in, day out. It's me against the me against my bike, me against the me in the pool, me in the black line, me on the road. It's me against me in the intervals. It's me against me in the expectations. You know how much more fun it is to go against somebody else, because again, like you're, you think about it, you are your hardest competition. Period. Because you know yourself inside and out. You know your your past obstacles. You know your what your self doubts and self criticism. You know the times you failed. You know what prevents you from doing your best. You also know your strengths, right? And you know that you can, right? So you're always battling your 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 most capable and knowledgeable opponent, right? It's like playing, you know, when you play against the person in your division, right? They are playing the playoffs, right? And you, you beat them twice in the regular season. You mean the playoffs are always like, yeah, they're going to lose. There's no way they can beat them three times in a row. 
Right? Because it's just there. What are the chances, right? Some because some you learn. Think about that when it comes to 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 training and ex- expecting things out of yourself and competing against yourself day in and day out. Yes, there's a time and a place to learn that and, and to learn how to negotiate and push yourself. But at some point, think of the freedom and the fun that comes with competing against other people, and how that can keep your own internal. Because I'll, I'll tell you this right now: as soon as I got done with the race. There was a guy I was talking to, and his wife was putting up the results. And I was like, "Hey, do you mind, you know, peeking to see what, see what I had?" And, and, I, and I've always been, I'm always been, a, I'm competitive in everything I do. I'm, I consider myself an athlete. And but she pulled up the results, and I was like, "I got fourth. I missed it on the third by a second, a second. And I 100% blame that on not having yanks in my shoes. I was the guy tying their shoes and transitioned during the sprint. Anyway, it immediately irritated me. <laughs> I wasn't disappointed with my result. I was actually very happy with it. I mean, first major, fourth overall, I was very happy. But it, I could tell it like flipped a switch of like competitive nature that I honestly hadn't felt in a while. I mean, I, I feel it when I play tennis because you're playing against somebody all the time, but it's not like real, right? I mean, it's real, but it's not a race. And I could just tell. And since that race, I mean, I haven't missed a training session. And I've kind of – that that it's like – Using other people to fuel the fire inside of you that you, you know, that can sometimes get burnt out, right? So you think about, you know, your flame over the course of the year. Well, it's hard to put fuel on your own fire, right? Whether you're externally or internally motivated, it's hard to fuel your own fire, frankly, because it's hard to do repetitively, but life also can dim it, right? It can remove energy. It can, it can take time and effort and energy away from you so you don't have as much right you know to do from the course today i'm sure most people work out better in the morning before they work because they, they, the work doesn't zap it you know zap them from it and so think about that over the course of the year right and how often you don't race or how often you do race is going to a race and racing and getting that that competitive drive that competitive spirit it's inside of you Right? Even though you think it might not be, it's just dormant. The door's closed. You don't know where the fucking key is. Go find the key. Right? Go to a race. Spectator race. Get excited about it. Because what you do when you do this thing is you actually let other people feel your fire. Just by being around. Just by being a competitor. Just by being an athlete. Just by choosing to race. What you do is you you might go up to the race like I did. With, I mean, competitive nature. You know, not wanting to to not do well. But I left with 20 times more, more fuel, more fire, right? And I can use that, right? It's kind of put, it's kind of kind of put in the bank. I don't tell you exactly what I did. I went home and I like perused the athlete results, and I was trying to look at, you know, who beat me and how much they beat me by, and how I can push that gap. And I was like, I haven't done that in forever. Mm. And it was fun, mm-hmm. and it wasn't making about beating somebody. It was, it was recognizing and then appreciating and honestly just understanding and being honest that. Yeah, you're an athlete. You're a competitor. And that's okay. Not not only is it just okay, but it's encouraged. Right? Because what it'll do, it'll help keep you moving, keep moving forward, keep you moving, keep keep committed, keep you accountable, keep you engaged, right? Keep you excited. And if you're all those things and you keep training, if you keep training, keep getting better. If you keep getting better, you keep getting more competitive. You do better. It all falls into that same bucket, right? Of keeping us, keeping us in the game. Period. It goes back to, you know, the coaches say this all the time. The best ability an athlete can have is availability. And most people think that in terms of injury, but it's also, where's your head at? Are you consistent? How motivated are you to train? Are you burnt out? Or are you not burnt out? Right? Availability is oftentimes way more important than just God-given athletic ability. So you got to be an athlete. Go out there. Find a race, right? And Maybe even don't tell anybody about it. And that's what I did. I even tell you. I, know. I just kind of. I mean, one of your athletes ratted me out. Daniela. I know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, you know, I know some local people here now, and I'm talk talk to a few people and a few listeners um, that were there. But I mean, I'm standing there like enjoying my quiet time and and being under the radar. And then oh, there rolls, you know, a C twenty three. Then she's like, ah. she's like, I thought you might be here. I'm like, man. Busted, <laughs> and then you texted me a few hours later. You're like, "Hey, nice job today." And I'm like, "Yeah, there you go, it works out." But just the the fun and not telling anybody and just showing up like for the fun of it, right? And then just to be whatever it is you want to be that day. Because I, I generally do believe that all athletes do take into most athletes take into consideration outside perception and way outside pressure when they race, and that does nothing but 
you know, keep you down, cause tension, right? Cause stress, you know, it makes you more likely to not just go for it. Cause if you, you know, if you, if you fall short, you fall short. But again, being, getting that competitive spirit, again, doesn't matter what end of the spectrum you're on top of the age group, bottom of the age group. If you ain't first, you're last, right? So unless you're the first person to finish or the last person, we're all in the middle. That's just it. We're all there. There's one fastest person on this planet and there's one least fastest. The rest of us, we're all in the middle, right? So you you have someone to compete against. You have someone to chase. And even if you don't think you can catch them, I can try to. Because I guarantee you a lot of times, you'll catch them. You'll catch them. Because frankly, you just might want it more that day. They might be staring at their bike computer or worried they might be just tilting over into zone four. And you'd be like, screw it, baby. I'm going zone five till, about, till my legs fall off. And just go for it. And it's just, again, like there's, like you said earlier, there's a time and a place to be calculated and to execute, right? And to stick with your guns and to walk, you know, but tell me now, you, you talk about Wisconsin last year. I wonder how many people's race plan went to shit before they even got out of the water, yeah. <laughs> right? Rain, cold. It's like, you just went straight to survival mode, right? And if you had done what you you stuck to your whatever plan it was, you might not have made it off the bike. But it was just a war of attrition. It was a war of resiliency. Thing I, I can't I can't do that. I know I'm gonna DNF, but I can't go over 105 watts today. I just, it's gonna teeter into my my gray zone, and and I can't do it. Just get it done, right? And it, it takes practice to do this. So you practice in training, you practice in these races that, that may or may not matter. But just, again, rip it in half of a gazillion, you know what happens? You get addicted to it. And again, addicted in a good way. You crave the competition. You crave that fire. You crave going after it. All that does is breed success. It, doesn't, it sure as hell doesn't breed weakness. It breeds, breeds strength, right? And confidence. That's what you want in an athlete. I was, Listen to another coach talk a few weeks ago, and he said, if, I put, if, you, if you put me on the starting line and I could look into 100 athletes' eyes, I could tell you, I could tell you which athletes were going to succeed and which ones are going to fail just by looking at them. And, I, and I, you and I talked about this word. I believe the same thing. Mm-hmm. The, the, you, can, you can see confidence. And guess what? You don't wake up confident. You are confident. It's something that you do. It's who you are. And it's not about being cocky. It's not about having an ego. It's about supporting yourself, being confident, right? Racing, being an athlete, expecting things out of you know, yourself that are transcendent, that not just an expectation that you fail as a resentment, but an expectation because if you speak about yourself positively and that you can do it, you can do it. Mm-hmm. And even if you can't, who cares, right? The point is to challenge the point is to challenge yourself. And that's the fun part of it, right? What's what's the fun part of taking the <laughs> taking the back door, taking the shortcut, right? If you want to be confident on a race day, you're gonna breed confidence in training, you gotta do things that instill confidence, not, you know, not be fine, not be paralyzed, not be okay, which is where we kind of fall in as a society, but expand, explore, challenge, because that, that is ultimately the only way. To breed success, or at least raise the the percentage of the opportunities to succeed every time you step on the race course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think I, I mentioned this, but you brought up Wisconsin again, and it just it sticks in my head. But the morning of the race, I did not want to do that at all. We're standing, you know, that feeling you're in, waiting to get in the water. You're standing in wet, puddled grass, barefoot, fifty some degrees. I didn't want to do it. I just could have easily went back. But I, that was the thing, man. I, I just flipped my mindset. I had to. I had no choice at that moment because I just didn't want to do Like the face the whole day was just daunting. Mm-hmm. I, I flipped it into a challenge. I said, like you said, it's just a battle. This is something. Then I'll, Then all of a sudden I wanted to do it. I just somehow got my head there that morning. I was like, this sucks. I don't want anything to do with it to... All right, this is what you're throwing at me. I'm gonna go out and figure out how to get it done. And and then I was like, I'm gonna shock the world. And then about halfway through the bike, I was like, All right, dude, just chill. You're just gonna get it done. (laughs) 
you know, because it was, yeah. But I, th- I, th- I think those are things that, uh, like you said, I mean, you just talk about it. It's just, it kind of got me fired up and I, it ignited a fire when I could have easily just drowned with no spark that morning. Yep. And yeah, there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing wrong. I mean, we have to ignite fires. That's a good thing. Burning, burning hot. I mean, and, and that's the thing, right? Is that most burnouts are self-inflicted. Mm-hmm. Period. Right. Yes. A lot, a lot of times, like if you're younger, they're on other people, right? You don't, you don't know better. Right. I got burnt out in swimming. Right. It, for a lot of reasons, you know, I was all in on it. Didn't have another sport to do. My parents were, you know, got to swim and coach over set up and, and right. But ultimately how I'm wired is that I put so much pressure on myself to be the best. So much pressure that there wasn't, there were no wins. Cause even if I did meet it, it, all I was doing was meeting and I wasn't exceeding anything. Where's the fun and not exceeding. Right. It's like expecting your kid to hit four home runs. If they hit four home runs. You're not even going to be happy. They just met the expectation. Right. So if they, most burnouts are self-inflicted. Period. You're you you became not objective. You put too many expectations, but you also made choices to not explore making it fun, or being an athlete, or competing more, right? And finding out things like we make those choices. So you just, again, in closing, we have opportunities. There are tons of opportunities: sprints, Olympics, five Ks, one mile races, duathlons, aquathons, grab. Be a fucking competitor. It's not a bad thing, right? It's not a bad thing to be a competitor and to want more or to want to win. It's also not because all about how you act right towards the people, but it's also about how you act towards yourself, right? And if you want more out of yourself, then it's not about expecting more out of yourself. It's doing more to get more out of yourself because, and that's where people fall short. And that's kind of the divide, the fence, right? that you, that athlete straddle will fall one side or the other is if you expect things out of yourself, but don't do things to get them out of you, then you're going to always fail and burn out. So instead of expecting things, a result out of yourself, expect to do things to be more engaged, to get the result. And that's it. Be engaged in the process and, and, and being an athlete and be a competitor and pushing yourself and taking risks, make that part of the process. Don't, it, don't, you know, again, because we think about, Racing and, and the burnout rate these days and how few people are racing is if you race once or twice a year, then your whole year is down to one. I don't like your chances. I'm just be honest. All right. To Let's to hang hurt. your hat on one race being the one you succeeded in or didn't succeed in. That's a lot of pressure. And instead of maybe racing five, six, seven, eight times. Hell, even if you fail three or four, but do awesome four, three to four, that's a push. Most times you're going to win more than you're going to lose. But what just you know what happens if that one day you don't do well or something else happens? Then that's all you're going to think about for that year. And again, that that goes right to that burnout mentality of you know, and that's that's why you got we you know just you just got to race more. You got to do more. You got to race more. You got to push yourself. You got to find yourself. And then you'll start to expect more out of yourself again, not from a standard and on a time, you know, standpoint, but just from, you know, more out of yourself as a competitor, which again, I think is a really, really good thing as a person. Yeah. It's easier to throw a log on a burning fire than it is to ignite a wet and soggy log. Mm -hmm. I like that. Don't be a wet and soggy log. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Be dry hay, right? Just be, don't be that. Um, that's a good one. I like that. Hey, that's a ton of the day. Don't be a soggy piece of wood. As always, it's true. Yeah. As always, we love you guys. We appreciate you. Um, I appreciate you uh, listening, be a part of the podcast. Hope you found today useful. And uh, most importantly, hope you get something out of it. Um, and uh, apply it to yourself. And you know what? Go out and race, no matter the distance, and push yourself. As always, we love you and appreciate you. Like I said, go to our website, C26 Triathlon, as our one-stop shop for all things coaching, camps, and community. 
You can also go to the online store and support us. Uh, the best way to support us, since we don't do sponsors and ads, is to go to our online store and uh, buy some gear and buy some swag. Get some great, uh, great stuff for the year. And then you can also go to um, the coaches tab. If you're looking for coaching and support for the rest of the year. Click on that tab and find the coaches right for you. As always, if you need anything from Mike, he's available. Crushing iron at gmail.com. If you need anything from me specifically, I'm at c26coach at gmail.com. All right, buddy. I will catch you later, man. See you, dude.